Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our lecture series. Today, I'm very excited about our speaker in particular. I think he's uh, uh, someone that I admire a lot and with uh, greater areas of research that are similar to what we do. So I, I'm very excited in particular about this lecture. We have today Dr. Ron Blankstein, who will be speaking about the expanding role of coronary CT and geography in 2023 and beyond. Dr. Blankstein is a professor of medicine and radiology at Harvard Medical School. He's the associate director of the cardiovascular imaging program and then director of cardiac CT. Uh, he is also a preventive cardiologist and also sees, uh, sees patients on top of imaging. Uh, he's a past president of the Society of Cardiac CT, and he's also in the board of directors of the American Society of Preventive Cardiology. He initially had his medical degree from Rush Medical College, and he did his residency and fellowship at the University of Chicago Medical Center. He then did an advanced imaging fellowship uh, at MGH, and then after that, he stayed in Boston at, at Brigham. His clinical interests are in the methods to identify and treat early stages of coronary heart disease, the prevention of cardiovascular disease, and also the diagnosis and treatment of cardiac sarcoidosis. Uh, Dr. Blankstein has published extensively with over 500 publications, many of them in uh, top journals. So it's a pleasure to have you here today. Very excited about your talk and thank you so much. Leandra, thank you for that very kind introduction. It's absolutely an honor for me to join all of you today. Uh, Monty is an institution uh, where I have many, many friends. I'll start with Mario Garcia, who uh, about 20 years ago came to University of Chicago and showed us some cases of cardiac CT. Uh, and I was a fellow around that time. And I said, wow, this is this is really cool. And I've always admired Mario for being kind of an early, early adopter of multimodality uh, imaging. Of course, uh, friends in the prevention world like uh, Rob Osfeld, who uh, really one of the premier preventive cardiologists in the country. So I love collaborating with, with Rob uh, Aldo, who I'm really proud to uh, call a former uh, former trainee who's an absolute superstar in, in uh, multimodality imaging and someone who's right now also working with us on the ACC Imaging Council. Uh, Mark Traven, who I've known for a long time through the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology, and I'm sure others who I'm forgetting. So. Uh, what, what a terrific group you have there, and it's really an honor to join all of you. Uh, on this slide, I'll start by showing my uh, my disclosures. Uh, I think relevant to this talk is that I'll talk about quantitative plaque imaging. So listed here are some of the companies in the space. Uh, I'm not going to mention any specific companies uh, uh, by name today. Um, and I guess my other disclosure is that I'm a multimodality imager. Uh, aside from cardiac CT, I'm involved in uh, all the other imaging modalities. But for today's topic, I'm really going to focus on, on CT. So I'm sorry for my uh, MR enthusiasts and nuclear enthusiasts and echo enthusiasts that I'm not going to cover that uh, as much. But that's just the nature of my topic for today. And I'll start with two cases just to, uh, because images are always nice to see and cases are always nice for us to think about the topics. The first one, a 61-year-old cardiologist was hypertension and hyperlipidemia who had some chest discomfort, atypical chest discomfort. So talked with us and said, hey, I'd like to get one of those coronary CT angiograms. And you can see here on this image, his LED. And you can see that in the, in the mid LED, he has this uh, lesion here. Uh, this ended up being what we would call moderate stenosis, which is 50 to 69 uh, uh, percent. And this is actually a challenge because you don't always know if a lesion like this is going to be flow limiting or not. Uh, often it's not, but it might be. Um, so one technique uh, with CT now is to do what's called FFR CT, which used the 3D data from CT and estimate what the invasive FFR would be. And in, in this case, it was 0 0.94 uh, telling us this is uh, uh, unlikely to be a flow-limiting lesion. I'll share another case of a 61-year-old male with psoriasis and chest pain who actually had a vasodilator SPECT done in our institution, which was normal. But he kept on having chest discomfort, and this actually led to a coronary CTA. Um, and he actually had three-vessel disease. He has severe uh, left main uh, stenosis. Uh, he has severe stenosis in his LED, uh, left circumflex, and RCA, and just a large amount of both calcified and non-calcified plaque. And of course, many of you would say, aha, he has psoriasis, when we know that now is a well-recognized risk factor for coronary disease and inflammation. And one of the things in this case is that we also had his 
uh, study evaluated by a technique I will talk about later, looking for inflammation, looking at the fat around the coronary artery. And in this particular case, we were able to establish, of course, that he has three vessel disease. He ultimately needed a cabbage, but also that he has inflammation as an important driver for his uh, disease. So for my talk uh, for today, I'm going to talk about the role of coronary CTA in different clinical uh, settings. And then I'll also discuss some of the techniques uh, ranging from FFRCT to plaque analysis to fat attenuation index. That's the technique I just showed you on the, on the last slide. Uh, I'll talk about the use of coronary CTA in asymptomatic individuals, which is certainly a topic that I think um, is, is getting some attention and I think is, is still debatable. And then I'll end with some future perspectives uh, for those of you who are trying to figure out where is this field uh, headed. So if you have not been paying much attention, uh, perhaps you're a non-imager uh, and you didn't know much about CTA, you could have woken up one day in 2021 and say, how did this happen? This new guideline comes out known as the chest pain guideline uh, led by Dr. Martha Golati, who I know joined you just last week for Grand Rounds. And in this new guideline, uh, coronary CTA now has a class one indication with level of evidence, what we call LOE of A, which is the highest level for both stable chest pain and acute chest pain. So this is really uh, a marked uh, uh, difference from prior guidelines that we've had. And part of it is because we actually haven't had a guideline addressing this topic in over a decade. But it's important to know that just like coronary CTA has a class one uh, indication in the, in the chest pain guidelines, so do all the other imaging uh, modalities. Um, and in fact, once we've identified that a patient has intermediate to high risk, uh, they may require imaging. And we have a lot of different imaging options. Um, and I think it's very challenging for, for all of us in cardiology sometimes to decide, like, what is the best test for a given patient? Um, and in the guideline, we give some advice on how to choose between these modalities. And of course, you have to think about what's available at your center. And of course, you have to think about what's going to give you good image quality. But if you happen to be in a place where all the modalities are available and you can get good image quality with all the tests, we would state in the guideline that CTA may be preferable to individuals who are younger, and particularly if they're not on optimal preventive therapies. And that has to do with the fact that CTA may be a technique that identifies plaque and helps us start patients on those preventive therapies. If the objective of testing is to rule out obstructive disease or perhaps to identify plaque, that would favor CT. On the other hand, if the objective of testing is to perform what's called ischemia-guided management, where we see how much ischemia a patient has, and if they have more ischemia, we think the symptoms are more likely to be due to that, and we may be more likely to revascularize them. If that's the objective, then really stress testing would actually be preferable. We also encourage individuals to look at prior test results. So if a patient previously had a equivocal uh, stress echo or stress MR, or stress nuclear considered a CT this time around. And conversely, if a patient previously had a inconclusive CT because the image quality wasn't good, or maybe they had a moderate lesion, this time around when you see them, you should actually think of a non-CT, of a stress test. So these are important principles. And I think another important principle is the fact that there is no single perfect test out there. So I'm going to talk a lot about CT and by no means is it the perfect test and by no means it's always the right test for, for everyone. But when we talk about CT, there are some advantages that I think are important for us to recognize. The first one, it is rapid uh, and it is safe. We don't, we're not stressing the heart here. We're not provoking uh, ischemia. All we do is sometimes give beta blockers to slow down the heart rate. We may give nitroglycerin to dilate the coronaries. Uh, patients lie on the on the table for for a couple minutes, but the actual scan acquisition uh, literally is under a second. The actual time that it takes to acquire the the images, the test is is highly accurate. I think over uh, 15 years ago, Mario Garcia taught us that one of the virtues of this test was its high negative predictive value. So if the test is negative, that's very reliable. But we've learned over time that it actually also uh, has a good positive predictive value, at least for detecting anatomical stenosis. But I think one of the differentiating features that makes CT different from most of the other tests is the fact that it can detect plaque. The type of plaque 
that we would never know that a patient has if they did not have a CT. In fact, this is such an important concept that in the recent chest pain guideline, there's now a class one indication uh, that for patients who have non-obstructive coronary disease, the type of plaque that we used to actually completely ignore in cardiology, that these patients who have non-obstructive disease now should have optimization of their preventive therapies. And specifically in the guideline, it's irrespective of how you detect that plaque. I mean, of course, that could be on a coronary CTA, but sometimes just a calcium score, or maybe even a chest CT that just happens to be in the PAC system that nobody paid attention to. So this is, this is important, and this is actually the first time in any U.S. guideline that plaque is used uh, to categorize coronary artery disease. So we're actually changing the definition of what CAD is. For the next slide, I want to share you, with you why is it actually important to identify a, a plaque by coronary CTA. And there are four reasons. The first one is that most stress tests that we do in the U.S., particularly in stable patients, are normal. Um, this is data from Cedar sinai showing prevalence of ischemia in the modern era of about 5%. The second fact is that most patients who have any imaging test, whether it's a stress test or coronary CTA, who go on to, uh, to experience an event, uh, if you look back, they actually had a normal uh, functional study. Uh, and this has to do with the fact that many patients that have a normal stress test may have significant amount of plaque, and that plaque could then lead to events. And statistically speaking, if most stress tests are normal, maybe it's not surprising that most events occur in patients who have a normal stress test. The, the third piece of information uh, is that we have learned that the amount of plaque that individuals have uh, may be a stronger predictor of their future risk of events than whether or not they have stenosis. In fact, in the study shown on this uh, slide here by Mortensen and colleagues from Denmark, they showed that once you account for the amount of plaque that is present, whether a patient has stenosis or not does not add to risk prediction. So it's the amount of plaque that matters. But probably the most important reason why identifying plaque is important is the fact that it can improve outcomes. And we think that this is exactly the mechanism that led to the improved outcomes observed in the Scott Hart trial. This is a, scar a trial for patients with stable chest pain in the UK, where patients were randomized to either coronary CTA on top of standard of care or standard of care alone, and the use of uh, coronary CTA led to a 41% reduction in CHD death or MI. And when the investigators went back and tried to figure out what's the mechanism for the improved outcomes, it all has to do with preventive uh, uh, therapies. So I talked about plaque, but I'm going to go back to stenosis because I will share with you that throughout the history of cardiology and the history of coronary CTA, we have always focused on stenosis. And on this slide is just an example of the spectrum of stenosis going from normal or minimal stenosis all the way to severe stenosis in an occluded vessels. But I will share with you that while stenosis is important, there is now a shift in coronary CTA that we are going to be focusing more and more on plaque burden. This is a recent uh, document known as CADRADS 2.0. This is a multi-society statement put together by the SCCT, ACC, ACR, and NASCI, which essentially defines uh, how to report a coronary CTA uh, and what are the recommendations we should give our clinicians after a coronary CTA. And there's a lot of information in this document and I won't go through all of it, but I do wanna share the fact that in this new CADRADS, reporting how much plaque an individual has is now something that we recommend for every single coronary CTA. And that particular reporting of plaque comes uh, in the form of a P category as P1, P2, P3, or P4, was P1 being mild plaque, P4 being extensive plaque. Now, if someone has a completely normal coronary CTA, you don't have to report this P category. It only applies when a patient actually has plaque. But when they do, every coronary CTA now should have a, a mention of this. And there are various techniques of how the individuals who read CT uh, uh, can actually decide on this. And I won't go through the details of, of all of them, 
But I would tell you that today, this is not done with uh, quantitative or fully quantitative techniques. This is usually done with a visual estimation or something known as a segment involvement score, which means how many segments have plaque. And our recommendations are that if individuals have severe amount of plaques, either P3 or P4, P4 being even more extensive, that those are individuals in whom aggressive preventive therapies are recommended. So let's stop and say, what does that mean? Aggressive preventive therapies. Is it, doesn't that just mean being on a stand? Does that mean a high intensity stand? And I would say, no, no. In 2023, there's a, a whole lot that we can do when we're thinking about aggressive prevention. And this slide summarizes some of those options. Of course, we start with lifestyle uh, therapies, exercise and, and diet. And, and I hope Rob uh, Osfeld is uh, uh, listening in because he uh, certainly would advocate for that as well. But then we can think of other things, more aggressive lipid lowering therapies beyond just statins, uh, uh, things like PCSK9 inhibitors, perhaps for some individuals when there's a large plaque burden. Icosapentethyl certainly uh, may be reasonable for some uh, individuals. Antiplatelet agents like aspirin. Uh, we typically don't give aspirin for a lot of our patients in primary prevention, but we do have data when there's a large amount of plaque. Those are patients who may be more likely to benefit from aspirin especially if they don't have a high risk of bleeding. Uh, hypertension as well. So if patients have uh, high blood pressure, our targets for treating them are gonna be lower when they have a lot of plaque. I personally like to use the sprint targets of trying to get patients under 120 over 80. And then diabetes management, uh, including GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, which I think are, can be very, very uh, powerful in prevention. Uh, and perhaps even for our non-diabetic patients if they're overweight. So our armamentum of prevention is, is really expanded and CT might be a tool to tell us who are the patients who really need all these aggressive therapies. So acute chest pain, let's talk about that. My comments so far uh, have been mostly on stable chest pain and I wanted to share with you uh, this entity as well, how we use CT. And I'll share this case from our hospital for a couple, from a couple months ago of a 66 year old male with intermittent exertional chest discomfort for five days. He comes to our ER. Uh, we now use high sensitivity troponin, which have a class one indication in the guideline, but uh, admittedly are still not being used in most centers in the US. And our chest pain guideline would tell us that uh, we, use, we need to use now what's called the clinical decision pathway. These are pathways that integrate clinical data and information on troponin to categorize our patients as low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. And the thought here is that low risk patients don't require any testing at all. Um, and uh, high risk patients should go to the cath lab and it's the intermediate risk patients in whom more testing is needed. So this is, this is now all in the new chest pain guideline. Now you may ask, well, what, what does low risk mean and what are these clinical decision pathways? And there's actually several such clinical decision pathways. And the one thing that they all have in common is how you define low risk. So low risk is defined here as less than 1% uh, 30-day risk of death or MACE. So that's how we define low risk. So for this patient, the clinical decision pathway, at least in our institution that we use, which is one of the more common ones in the US is the heart score. Uh, and you can see here the criteria on this slide, and we give them various uh, uh, points based on the history, the EKG, the age, and risk factors, and the troponin, and he gets a five, and five puts you right in the intermediate risk uh, category. In fact, four to six is intermediate risk, and based on that, if we um, look at the next uh, kind of step in our uh, pathway here, intermediate risk means that he uh, may benefit from more testing. If we now look at the guideline, just like in stable chest pain, I told you there's lots of different options and essentially everything has a class one recommendation. The same thing applies in acute chest pain. So acute chest pain, our guideline tells us um, uh, testing is helpful if you're intermediate risk. And for both anatomical testing with CTA and for stress testing with essentially any modality you want to choose, have a class one indication in the right clinical scenario. So this is a CTA talk. So this patient underwent a coronary CTA and despite a normal uh, high sensitivity troponin, we uh, saw high grade stenosis in the right coronary artery in the left circumflex and in the diagonal branch. 
in, in this was confirmed on invasive angiography. So what are some of the advantages of coronary CTA in acute chest pain patients? First, the fact that this is a rapid test. Uh, you really, uh, we used to say you only need one troponin value, but now in the era of high sensitivity troponin, I think you can say that about all the imaging modalities, that one negative troponin is all you need. So historically, CTA had the advantage that it can decrease hospital lengths of stay. It's also very rapid to do this test compared to some protocols with spec that may take three hours. But I think that advantage is actually going down in the era of high sensitivity troponin because now you can do most tests rapidly. So I think that's a relative uh, advantage. Um, CTA, I think, is helpful in excluding plaque or stenosis. And potentially another advantage is the identification of other alternative explanations. And you can see those on this slide here, ranging from a pericardial effusion to hiatal hernia, a aortic dissection, or, or aortic plaque, these are all entities that may cause symptoms. Um, so there's been to date nine different trials of coronary CTA in the ER. And really the, the summary from all of them is that CTA is useful mostly as an efficient way to get patients out of the hospital sooner. Um, a more challenging question is what about higher risk patients, patients who actually are having an ACS or having elevated troponins? And I think this is where there's equipoise or perhaps uncertainty. Well, we can look at the ESC guideline, uh, and, and these came up before the US guidelines, and the US guidelines actually don't address this entity head on. But if we look at the ESC guideline, they would have a class 1A indication for excluding an acute coronary syndrome in low to intermediate uh, likelihood of CAD when either the troponin or the EKG are normal or inconclusive. So basically it's patients who are having an ACS and maybe the troponin's a little elevated or maybe the EKG is uncertain. Certainly if a patient has real deal ACS, they have already ruled in for an end STEMI. I don't think CTA has a big role there. It's really more if there's uncertainty, this is where uh, CT may have a role. To share some examples of that, here's a 38-year-old male with uh, a chest pain, came to our ER. He was actually about to be discharged uh, because the team thought that this was pericarditis. His chest pain was actually positional. He had a mild elevation in his troponin values, and prior to discharge, he was already feeling well, but they just wanted to make sure the coronaries are okay. He had a coronary CTA, and he has uh, essentially a, 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 a occlusion of his right coronary artery, uh, and he's a young person. I'm, I'm certainly one of my areas of interest is why do young individuals get atherosclerosis? And importantly, not just in the RCA as disease, but also in the LAD and circumflex, he also had some plaque showing us that uh, while he's only in his 30s, he already had atherosclerosis um, uh, developing. So that's one, one example. Uh, but I think some other examples we have are from the COVID era. Here's the EKG of a 32-year-old male admitted was COVID pneumonia, but was having some chest discomforts, which is hard to know, maybe that's the pneumonia, and had an elevated troponin. And in fact, early in the pandemic, uh, there was all these reports of patients with COVID was ST elevations. Uh, and these were, uh, we first all learned about them from Twitter under the hashtag COVID STEMI. Uh, and only after it was described in Twitter, a couple of months later, it was actually described in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, actually from an experience in New York that many of you may be familiar with. Uh, but this particular patient who has ST elevations in V2 and V3 and V4, uh, we brought him to our uh, CT area uh, and no coronary plaque and no, no stenosis. I do want to make the point that CTA, and I think I, I mentioned this already, might be less useful in, in and really our true high-risk patients was ACS. So I think we have to be very careful with the use of coronary CTA in patients with elevated enzymes. And the trial that showed the, the absence of benefit is a trial known as the DISCHARGE trial. This is from the UK. This is a, a, a study of coronary CTA uh, versus standard of care in patients who have a diagnosis of ACS. And this trial actually included many patients who already have known coronary heart disease, including prior MI, prior cabbage, prior stents. 
Yeah, and anyone who does coronary CTA, so Aldo, when he's listening here, he's probably cringing and saying, why would you do a coronary CTA if this person already has stents and cabbage? That's just the wrong population. And in fact, I think that's exactly what happened here is CTA didn't do anything to improve outcomes in one year. In fact, you could argue even in the right population, why would CTA improve any outcomes in one year? Because if CTA leads to preventive therapies, the benefit of that takes longer than a year. And if CTA just shows us patients who need to be revascularized, um, you know, if they're high risk and have elevated troponins, they're going to go to the cath lab anyhow. So why would there be any benefit? So just a cautionary note there. Let's move on to the technique of FFR uh, uh, CT. So at times with CT, I showed you this in the, uh, the very first case I showed you at the beginning of our hour, you may have an intermediate uh, lesion of uncertain significance. This ends up being about 10% of the time, at least in our center, uh, and of course, there's a lot of options of what you would do to evaluate that lesion further. If at all, you could decide to just treat the patient medically. But one option is to do what's called FFRCT. It's a technique that uses computational fluid dynamics to estimate what the invasive FFR would be if we did one. And on the example on the left here, here's an FFRCT of 0 0.85. So if it's more than 0 0.8, we would say just like an invasive FFR, this would be a, a negative FFRCT. And we have data from uh, several studies, but uh, uh, most notably the advanced registry, uh, which is non-randomized uh, observational data showing us that when patients have an FFRCT that's more than 0 0.8, their event rate is very low, even when they have stenosis, um, essentially supporting the fact that it is completely safe to avoid invasive angiography in these patients and have possible stenosis if the uh, FFRCT is, uh, is normal. But the big question that I think a lot of people uh, ask, and, and I, certainly something that we like to go over with all our trainees is, what is the difference between FFR and perfusion imaging? And I know this audience probably knows some of this really well, but I think it's still important to always review that. So FFR, whether it's in the cath lab or done with CT, is a lesion-specific measure of ischemia. So it says at a particular lesion, is there a flow limitation? And would fixing that lesion improve flow? On the other hand, when we look at myocardial perfusion imaging, whether it was SPECT or PET or stress echo uh, or MRI, it's an overall measure of blood flow uh, that incorporates disease throughout the entire epicardial tree, perhaps also the microvascular tree. And in a way, it's actually more physiologic because it's what the myocardium is actually seeing. If you are a single myocyte and you're concerned about what blood flow am I getting, it's the myocardial perfusion imaging that actually uh, um, incorporates all that and saying how much blood flow is the, is the myocardium actually seeing. And perhaps for that reason, uh, myocardial perfusion imaging in, in some studies is actually a better prognostic measure uh, when we look at prognosis. Um, it encapsulates a lot of information. But at the same time, if your question is, is a particular lesion going to benefit from revascularization? This is where FFR may be beneficial. And in reality, the two are probably very much complementary. It's, it's not a competition of one is better than the other. They're different pieces of information. They're very much complementary. And you can have cases where the FFR is normal, but, but the perfusion is not, usually when there's diffuse disease. And you can, and vice versa, you can have cases where the FFR is abnormal, but the rest of the vessel is healthy and the myocardial perfusion imaging is normal. So we shouldn't expect that these were always going to go in the same direction. But if we go back to our guidelines, the big question still is, well, when do we need to do any of these tests after a coronary CTA? So if a patient actually has a coronary CTA, I want to first say, when should we go directly for invasive angiography after a CTA? So that's always a big question. And the answer is patients who have high risk anatomy. Uh, so high risk, uh, I'm not sure if my pointer is uh, shown. Uh, do, you, do you see my pointer? I don't know. I, we saw it before. Uh, let me just take a second to do that, to put that on. So, so again, hi. There we go. So if patients have high risk uh, uh, CAD, which is shown in uh, or right here, that means left main or three vessel disease, or if they have very frequent angina. So those are the patients that if they have uh, obstructive disease should go for invasive angiography. 
However, what if patients don't have high risk anatomy and perhaps they have some angina, but it's not all that frequent. Uh, this is where the guidelines provide a class 2A indication to either do an FFRCT or a stress test. Um, and this doesn't mean that you have to do this. These are optional uh, tests for patients who have obstructive disease. If they don't meet the criteria to go to the cath lab, you can always choose to treat those patients medically. So you don't have to do an FFR in everyone and you don't have to do a stress test in everyone. But if they have symptoms and, and there's some uncertainty, this is where these tests are, are helpful. On the right side of this slide is the indication in the guideline for FFRCT. Uh, and it's specifically is when there's 40 to 90% uh, percent stenosis. Um, it's also in lesions that are proximal uh, to mid lesions in the coronary arteries. FFRCT does not work quite as well in distal vessels. Uh, so if there's a question of uh, lesion specific ischemia and to help guide the decision for revascularization, this is where FFRCT has a class 2A indication. Level of evidence is BNR. NR means no randomized uh, trials when this uh, recommendation was put together. Well, we now do have a randomized uh, trial in this area, and I'm going to share that on this slide. This is a trial known as the PRECISE trial. This was uh, presented at the recent AHA. I, I don't think it's actually published yet. And this is a trial in patients with stable chest pain who are randomized to uh, a strategy known as the precision strategy, where first patients who were uh, low risk, according to a uh, low risk uh, score called PROMISE minimal risk score, which was developed in a PROMISE study. In a small proportion of patients who are low risk, there was a recommendation to avoid all testing altogether. And then in patients who are not low risk, under the precision strategy, they all underwent a coronary CTA with selective use of FFR uh, CT, which I believe was around 30% of the time in this trial. On the other hand, usual testing was to go ahead and do a functional testing approach, and it was up to the site uh, in clinicians to decide, and that was a combination of stress echo, SPECT, PET, basically any sort of uh, functional test that the investigators wanted to do uh, at the site. So this was a, uh, a, a one-year uh, trial uh, looking at the outcome of death, non-fatal MI, or going to the cath lab and not having obstructive disease. And on this slide are the results. This trial showed that the precision pathway, which essentially was mostly based on the use of CTA and FFRCT, led to a 70% reduction in the composite endpoint of death MI or cath without obstructive disease. Now, it's important to note that this was driven, this result was driven by the invasive angiography without obstructive coronary disease, because if you look at uh, death alone or MI alone, there was no difference between the groups. And you can pause and say, is, is that important? Going to the cath lab and not having obstructive disease as an endpoint, is that, is that important? And, and I think the answer is yes, it is, a, it is an endpoint that's relevant to our patients. If you're told you have an abnormal stress test and you have to go to the cath lab and you go through a procedure that still has a small rate of complications, uh, and then you're told, well, actually, you don't have much disease, you, you don't need anything. Uh, is, if that's something we can avoid, that's probably a good thing. All right, we're gonna now turn our attention to something totally different, which is quantitative uh, plaque analysis. So I'm gonna share with you this case here. This is a 59 year old male, family history of coronary disease, not on uh, any medical uh, therapy. And this person was actually asymptomatic. He happened to have had a CTA, a cardiac CT to look for an ASD. He actually never ended up having a, uh, uh, an ASD, but we did find plaque and in fact, uh, in here, we found that in the LED, uh, mild uh, stenosis, so there's a little bit of calcified plaque, but he had a large amount of non-calcified plaque. And you can see here, mild stenosis in, in the LED. Uh, using the CADRADS document that I shared with you, we gave him a P3 uh, classification, which means large amount of plaque. And this was mostly done using our visual assessment of how much plaque he has. Based on that finding, our recommendation in the report was aggressive risk factor modification and preventive therapies by the virtue that he has a large amount of plaque. However, one of the things that I think we are gonna see more in the future is this aspect of quantitative uh, plaque assessment. So not a visual estimation of plaque, but an actual technique to quantify plaque. As of today, there's actually three FDA approved companies that now have products to quantify plaque. And, and this slide is just one of those products. 
And what it does is it reports for every single vessel, the total amount of plaque, calcified plaque, non-calcified plaque, and low attenuation plaque. And for this particular patient, if we look at the total amount of plaque on the bottom of the slide, you'll see that actually most of the plaque was non-calcified uh, uh, plaque. Another example of quantitative plaque analysis from a, from a different vendor is, is this one here. And this is a 55-year-old uh, male who has plaque in the LED. And on the right side of the slide is the LED two years later. And you can even visually see here uh, that the lumen improves. There's actually a reduction in stenosis in this case, but also when you look at the quantitative plaque burden, that was reduced by 41% as well. So this kind of uh, brings up this topic that perhaps in the future we can use coronary CTA, whether in clinical trials or maybe in clinical care to see how well individuals are responding to medical therapy. Uh, certainly a lot of work needs to be done in this area before this is something that's used in prime time, but I think this is one potential direction of, of this to see, can we actually quantify the response to various medical therapies? Now, I'm sure everyone's heard that there's this concept of high-risk plaque characteristics, and I think in cardiology, we used to have this holy grail, can we find high-risk plaques? And at least in the invasive world, I think that concept, you know, is still there, but, but we've, we, we've realized that's actually a very tough thing to do. So on CT, we also have various characteristics that have been shown to, to be of high risk. For example, a low CT attenuation, which generally means lipid-rich plaque napkin ring sign, which also has some lipid-rich plaque in the necrotic core. Um, spotty calcification is probably the weakest of all these high-risk features. And positive remodeling, also known as Glagov remodeling, which essentially is a surrogate for having a very large amount of uh, plaque. And you can identify a lot of these features just visually. So when, when you look at a coronary CTA, these are things that the reader should be able to identify without any fancy uh, techniques. However, there are fancy techniques also, whether there's some of the quantitative software or using radiomics, and there's different ways to identify these. But the big question is, do they actually provide anything with respect to risk? And on this slide, you can see data from both the PROMISE study on the left, the Scott Hart study on the right. These are both trials in stable chest pain uh, patients, showing that when high risk characteristics are present, uh, patients generally have a higher event rate. Um, however, from Scott Hart, one of the findings which I think is important is that once you adjust for a, a coronary artery calcium scan, which in general is a surrogate of how much plaque individuals have, there's no longer a difference, meaning high-risk plaque features no longer added to risk assessment uh, once you accounted for the amount of plaque. So I think the jury is still out regarding how important these high-risk plaque characteristics are. I think we still report them. They certainly contribute to, to risk, but once you, you account for overall amount of plaque, their incremental value may be a bit smaller. Another technique uh, that I wanted to at least share with you, because I think it's, it's exciting, but I would also be cautious in telling you this is not FDA approved. This is not something that anyone is doing uh, outside of the research realm, but I think it's still kind of interesting is this technique known as fat attenuation index. And the premise behind this has to do with the fact that around the coronary arteries, there's epicardial uh, fat. And essentially, when there's inflammation in the coronary arteries, there's cytokines that communicate between the coronary artery and the fat. And those cytokines, the impact of them is to uh, decrease lipolysis uh, and essentially uh, have more inflammation, higher water count, and so the Hounsfield unit becomes less negative uh, so we can see changes uh, in the attenuation of the fat around the coronary arteries. And then in later stages, there is probably some uh, degree of fibrosis that actually happens within the epicardial uh, of fat. So these are changes in the fat. Uh, and those changes seem to be uh, uh, is strong, strongly associated with future events. Uh, in fact, uh, it, an abnormal phi, at least in this uh, one study from the group in Oxford, uh, showed a much higher risk of myocardial infarction uh, than whether high-risk plaque was present. And importantly, this measure was incremental to the calcium score, not, not in the study on this slide, but in other studies. So this is a measure that may be uh, particularly useful in patients who perhaps don't have a lot of plaque, maybe not have any plaque, uh, but they have ongoing inflammation, and that inflammation may be a driver for a higher risk. 
or maybe that inflammation is a need for anti-inflammatory therapies in the future. Um, here's an example on this slide of two individuals. Uh, and again, this is not part of clinical care, but we did this uh, on an investigational basis. And the, the reason I'm showing this is both of these individuals, they were both 63. They both had various inflammatory uh, uh, conditions, as you can see on this slide. And they both had the exact same amount of plaque. That's what I like about this, this slide here, except that the patient on the, on the right uh, has a fat attenuation index that's at the 58th percentile. Kind of, you see all the yellow color here, not all that impressive, but the patient on the left had their fat attenuation index at the 95th percentile, where you see kind of more red and blue, which are uh, on this color code, uh, uh, much more abnormal, corresponding to more inflammation. So I think this is one of those things that perhaps in the future, if we have an anti-inflammatory therapy that's effective, I would be more likely to give it to the patient on the left that has abnormal inflammation. Let's end by talking about coronary CT and asymptomatic patients. And I, I decided to include this because every time I don't include this in the talk, this always comes up during the Q&A. They say, well, you show these great images. Why are we still doing calcium scores? Why not just do a coronary CTA? Um, and I would share that this is, this is an ongoing debate. I would say the adv potential advantages of coronary CTA is that it helps us look at not just the calcified plaque, but also the non-calcified plaque. And you would ask, well, who are those patients that just have a lot of non-calcified plaque? Uh, and I would tell you that most individuals that have non-calcified plaque are also going to have some calcium. And this is why the calcium uh, score is actually very useful at telling us who has plaque. But patients who tend to have more non-calcified plaque are generally those who have systemic inflammatory diseases, HIV, perhaps younger patients with, with very strong family history if we image them before calcified plaque develops. So certainly in, in the right patients, there may be a better opportunity to detect plaque and detect risk when we look at coronary CTA. And certainly if we capture some of the information on stenosis, that also adds to risk. But there's a downside. Well, one downside is the cost of coronary CTA is certainly more expensive. And you can say contrast, uh, you know, depending on your perspective, even though contrast for most patients uh, usually is, is well tolerated and very, very unlikely to lead to things like uh, uh, kidney injury, that, that whole area is actually open for, for debate right now. Um, but I think the biggest downside of coronary CT in asymptomatic individuals is that when we have individuals who will not know how to use the results uh, and they'll see a mild stenosis or a moderate stenosis on an on a asymptomatic person, and before you know it, they can end up getting unnecessary stress tests or even end up in the cath lab. And we never would want that for our asymptomatic individuals. And I think that's the concern. So as long as we know how to use the results appropriately, and we don't use them to drive unnecessary testing, I think there could be a role, at least in selected individuals. Um, and that's what happens in my own institution today. There are some patients that we are concerned and we will do a coronary CTA. Uh, but I, and I would tell you that's not supported by any guidelines as of now. None of the guidelines would ever recommend a coronary CTA in asymptomatic patients. So this is, this is one of those things you do in very selected cases. I'll tell you that there's a trial that's testing exactly that, and that's the Scott Hart 2 trial in the UK. And it's taking asymptomatic individuals and it randomizing them to CTA versus standard of care uh, risk assessment was a score that they use uh, in the UK. So potentially this trial is either gonna further open the door or maybe close the door on the use of CTA in asymptomatic individuals. But I think some of the important questions that I have in this area is, of course, will this improve outcomes? Um, how could a coronary CTA compare with calcium score? And we have some data that it probably has better information when it comes to risk assessment, but will that improved information be enough to overcome the, the excess costs uh, or uh, this concern about excessive testing? So let's talk about the future in the, in the next uh, just couple minutes. Um, and one of, a, one of the issues that I think is important for all to know is coronary CTA is rapidly growing. Uh, and anyone who does CTA knows this. Whenever we get together now for CT meetings, I think everybody, uh, there's a couple of common conversations, but one of them is the fact that anyone doing CTA feels that the volumes are up. Uh, and, and there's certainly a lot of um, uh, need for more imagers. Um, I would tell you that one of the things that's going to continue to um, 
accelerate our advances is also improvement in uh, technologies in CT. So one of the big ones is improvement in hardware. There's a newer generation of CT scanners known as a photon counting CT that's further improving the resolution and also eliminating one of the issues, uh, or at least attenuating, maybe not completely eliminating, one of the issues with CT, which is calcium blooming artifacts. As our resolution of our scanners improves, um, the issue of uh, uh, reading when patients have calcium or stents in their coronaries, which today can be problematic, is, is, is going away. Today, there's a real shortage in uh, both cardiologists and radiologists who are trained in CT. Uh, this is particularly uh, noticeable around the country. Um, and uh, on this slide here, just uh, I want to share some of my viewpoints on this. Is first of all, this is an editorial I wrote in Jack saying that tr training in cardiac CT is now essential for every cardiologist. Uh, this is a requirement for every fellow COCATS level one. And I think this is important as cardiac CT now is becoming a a very uh, mainstream modality in clinical cardiology, just like it is uh, important to train in all the other modalities. We have training guidelines, uh, both for cardiologists and radiologists, and what it means to be a level two or a level three. Uh, and, and I would encourage any of the fellows uh, listening, uh, beyond just being level one training, which is the basic minimum, to say, hey, maybe I need to be trained in level two during my training. Uh, you happen to be in an excellent uh, program with excellent readers. I think that is something that all, all the fellows should think about. You know, I need to invest in this. I'll also share with you that prevention is one, of, if I think about the future of CT, the reason why I think CT is going to continue to grow is that from trials like Eschema and others, we know that we today have a big emphasis on prevention. Yet most of the medical therapies that we are uh, using beyond stands have only been approved in secondary prevention, when someone's already had a heart attack, already had a stent. And one of the things that uh, CT might do is help us identify patients who have not yet had these events, but have a high enough risk. Uh, and this is used in trials today. So on this uh, uh, slide here is, a, uh, is the Vesalius trial. And this is a trial using a PCSK9 inhibitor in individuals who have not yet had an MI or stroke. So this is different from Fourier that took individuals in secondary prevention. And this is a, so speak, uh, primary prevention, uh, at least from an FDA perspective, and it's taking individuals who've not had these events. And to be included in this trial, you need to have atherosclerosis. And of course that could be identified in the cath lab, but a high calcium score or coronary CTA are enough to get into this trial. And I think we're going to see in the future more and more use of imaging in clinical trials to identify these high-risk patients in whom we might want to test therapies that traditionally we've only tested and have only been uh, validated in secondary prevention populations. So um, I talked about all these complex things, and I want to go back to the basics because at the end of every talk, people will always ask, well, who should I really do a CT in? On, and I would say that it's useful in patients who do not have known coronary disease if we think we can get good image quality. And that's what it comes down to. And it's not useful in our patients who are morbidly obese or, or those who have massive calcifications or who have coronary stents. And I talked about all these techniques and people would still say, well, what's available today? And of course, uh, you, you can call Aldo and say, what's, what's available? But I'll say that um, uh, in Montefiore and at Brigham, uh, today, with every coronary CTA, we're going to give you an evaluation of how much stenosis someone has. We're going to provide an evaluation of the plaque burden. FFR CT uh, may be available in, in select cases, and this is somewhat site dependent. Not every site is going to have this. Quantitative plaque assessment, I talked about that, but it's still mostly in the research realm. This is not something that's routinely used by uh, in cardiac CT. And then the fat attenuation index only in the research space. So just wanted to provide that. So in summary, uh, coronary CTA provides us with an accurate detection of both plaque and stenosis. We have uh, data from uh, trials showing that the use of CTA uh, may lead to a lower uh, event rate, specifically CHD death or MI. FFR CT may avoid unnecessary invasive angiograms. It does require good image quality, as does uh, many of our advanced techniques in CT. Plaque analysis will likely allow us to have e even better uh, risk assessment. We can use it to evaluate response to therapy, uh, and it might have a, an important role in clinical trials. In fact, I have a core lab that we use this technique specifically for uh, uh, clinical trials and drug development space. Uh, 
And then advances in technology. I didn't go into this in a lot of topic, in, in a lot of detail, but both in AI and photon counting CT will further expand the capabilities, image quality, and ultimately the impact of cardiac CT. So with that, I, I want to thank everyone. I'm just a couple minutes late, but hopefully we uh, will still have some time for discussion. Thank you so much. What a wonderful lecture. Uh, and it's a Every time I hear lectures like this, I get more enthusiastic about the future of cardiac CT as well. So thank you very much. Uh, we have also Dr. Garcia uh, who joined us. Uh, Dr. Garcia, would you like to start with the first question? First of all, I wanna, I wanna say that for um, those uh, who are attending, who have attended this lecture, <clears throat> you will receive a one hour complete board review uh, on cardiac CT, uh, short of not having anything about physics, which is the part that um, unfortunately we need to read, but everything else covers um, what is important in the field. So Ron, it's, um, you know, have a, I, I have nothing else to say, but uh, what a wonderful uh, trajectory that you had. Since, I, um, since you are a fellow, I remember you at the um, University of Chicago. So, um, uh, one of the things that, that caught my attention was <clears throat> your slide uh, commenting on the um, results of a score heart two, uh, comparing uh, calcium score versus uh, versus uh, uh, total volume of plaque, and and I wonder if part of the reason why calcium score remains so strong is because it's so easily uh, to quantify and so reproducible. And when I look at, uh, at CAT uh, RATS2 and uh, the effort of uh, putting this number of segments being involved, I wonder whether <clears throat> semi quantitative um, assessment that doesn't rely on um, some AI assistance uh, may have that particular disadvantage that. Uh, Yes, you can have you know one individual with a segment that are involved with you know tiny uh, calcified plaques, and you may have somebody else that have two segments with horrendous uh, uh, bulk of uh, non-calcified plaque that is very extensive, and, and that is not uh, particularly measured uh, in, in that uh, category. Mario, thank you for your, your comments and, and, and for that question. It's, it's actually a really important question, um, which I showed you the different ways we quantify uh, plaque. And, and, and I agree that calcium score is probably much more reproducive than the segment involvement score of visual analysis. The reason why we, we gave various options in CADRADS, we said you can use the calcium score, you can use the segment involvement score, you can use a visual is because not every institution uh, does a calcium score as, as part of every coronary CTA. We, in fact, don't in my institution. Uh, there's arguments for and against it. It's a little bit more radiation. It's, it's a little bit more work to do a calcium score. Um, and, and you would say that typically if you, you can get an estimate of how much plaque people have even without a calcium score. So if a calcium score is performed as part of your institution, I think it makes a lot of sense to use that to estimate the plaque burden for the exact reasons that you just uh, stated. Now, if a calcium score is not done, this is where you can use the segment involvement score. You can do a visual and we, we give more, um, uh, more advice on how to do that visual estimation. Um, the, the, the whole point of CADRADS2 is we wanted to move the field towards reporting how much plaque people have. And, and one of the things I, I said to the whole group when we wrote this is it doesn't matter if people don't get it exactly right. It, the important thing is as a field, we get people to start thinking about this in CADRADS2.0 to use at least one method. And in the future, I think we're going to refine this a whole lot more. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll go with the next question. Uh, so we have the pleasure to have you here. You 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 were you wrote the CADRATS 2.0 that we use here. My question is, you always mentioned that, and I agree that the test alone doesn't change the outcomes. And you just gave an example of preventative therapy that can help. And also an example, if in an asymptomatic patient, you do too much, you can actually cause harm as well. So when we use the CADRATS 2.0, should we put a recommendation for clinicians of what should they do? Should we include that in the report? So we should, should we just report the, the plaque? Yeah, so the, the, the notion behind CADRAD is to actually put a recommendation and there's, I, I didn't get, show this today, but there's very specific tables in CADRADS. I think there are tables nine and 10, if I, if I got that right, that has a specific recommendation of what to put in the report. 
And I have to share with people that when I was earlier in my uh, career, I was very hesitant to put those recommendations because I said, who am I, a, a, a kind of a, a new attending at, at this hospital right behind me to tell some of the premier cardiologists in the world, like how to treat their patients and whether to use preventive therapy. I, and I didn't want to put it there. I, I And I was completely wrong uh, because I learned that uh, the referring clinicians, they're not looking at the images and they actually really appreciated having that information there. So I, I, I think today it's a, it's a really essential thing because uh, exactly as you're saying, the images uh, uh, don't test, don't don't change patient management. It's how we act on it. And if you look at national data on CT or data from the Promise trial or Scott Hart trial or any data you look at, um, the uh, it's still uh, surprising to me how often we actually don't treat patients who have plaques. So if you look at national data, we don't do a good job in implementing preventive therapies. So if a line like that in the report may be a reminder. For the patient or for the physician to do that, I think it's important. Thank you. Thank you very much. I agree. So thank you for the recommendation. So we can say at least it's in the guidelines what we put there. Uh, any yeah. questions, Aldo? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ron, uh, you know, again, thank you for this uh, spectacular talk as, as, as per usual. Uh, I really enjoy how you uh, uh, put really complex topics into, you know, very simple terms and, and make it easy to digest. Uh, something that I always Try to remember and adjust to my, you know, to my talks and my my presentations. So, so thank you for that and and thank you for all the training. I think you know, uh, I remember then since day one in training, we have been doing this about plant quantification. You know, this is like three years, two three years prior to the Catlats two uh, two point oh. So, um, so I, I'm a total believer uh, of the you know of you know of the use of of plant quantification to guide management. Um, one thing that I kind of struggle or where I see other people asking frequently is how you, yeah, we, we agree that if you have a lot of, a lot of flag, you're going to be more aggressive in your treatment, but do you have any, any pearls in terms of like, is, is a P2 the transition is, is, is P4 when you put everything. So when do you make the transition? Yep. And, and I guess you incorporate also like flag characteristics. That, that's question number one. Question number two if, is if you can uh, make a, a brief uh, comment on, what would be your recommendation for high risk plaque? We get a lot of calls, the same as we got in, you know, I got in training with you in terms of patient, you know, physician saying, now what, what I do with this patient? Should I send the patient for the cath lab? You're saying it's a high risk plaque. So, you know, is the patient gonna have an MI like, you know, now? So, so what are your recommendations regarding that? And, yeah. and three, do you think there's, there's role for personalization of care and try to kind of differentiate active versus Kind of inactive or calcified plaque, and maybe colchicine might have a kind of a, an increased role in those patients with increased phi, you know, a lot of low activating plaque and so forth. Yeah, no, all, all great questions. I'll try to, to give you a quick reply. So, the, the first question was about like at what level of the P score do you really think of a higher risk? So, P1, when you don't have a lot of plaque, we say consider preventive therapies. P2, we say you, you have some plaque you know, uh, we recommend preventive therapies. It's P3 and P4, which is the equivalent of a calcium score over 300, where your risk starts to approach those of secondary prevention patients. Uh, and this is where our recommendations and the guideline for P3 and P4 is for aggressive preventive therapies. Um, I think if you're at P4, P4 is similar to calcium score over a thousand. And I think in that group, there's no debate that you're at the same level of risk as secondary prevention population. So at that point, you know, I think it's fair to think of any aggressive preventive therapies, just like you would in a patient who's had a prior MI or prior prior stent. Uh, P3, I think there's enough there that you can think of aspirin, uh, at least in selected individuals. You can think of more uh, more aggressive LDL lowering therapies. Um, your second question after that uh, was remind me the I second. Respect. Yeah, high, yeah, that's a really that's a really tough one, and I think you're exactly right. Sometimes people see that in a report, and it sets off like uh, excess alarms. And if you see that in a in a patient that has mild stenosis, you certainly do not need to send that patient to the cath lab or to do a stress test. It's just a, another measure of probably higher risk and more preventive therapies. Uh, maybe if you're not sure if a lesion is flow limiting, maybe a moderate stenosis, there is some data that the high risk plaque features infer that that plaque is more likely to be flow limiting. So, you know, that might help. But in general, we don't use high-risk plaque today to dictate differences in therapy. We say that patient might be a higher risk, but there's nothing we do today that's all that different uh, added on top of the P-score and added on top of the stenosis. 
And your third question was on personalized care based on CT. And, and you're right, in the future, something like anti-inflammatory therapy might have a role in patients who, who have some abnormality. I think we're, we're a couple of years away, obviously, from more data and more trials than that, but that certainly is one possibility in the future. Thank you very much. We have a, a related question from Mercedes Quiroga. She says, in preventive cardiology, when you already evaluated the plaque and the non-obstructive CAD diagnosed with CT, and you decide to treat, like we said, when should you repeat if you should repeat another CCTA to see if there's progression or regression? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. We don't have a lot of data in terms of cohorts that have serial uh, imaging. In, in my, my answer is generally only if you think it's going to uh, change therapy. So if there's someone that you're very concerned about uh, and there's some therapy that you've decided not to implement, it's kind of in the back pocket and you're saying, I'm only going to use that if things are going the wrong way, that might be a reason to repeat. But I would caution people about repeating just for the sake of curiosity, for example, to, to see how things are changing. Because especially if someone has a large amount of plaque and we decide to put them on the most aggressive uh, therapy, we're getting the LDL under 50, uh, they're seeing Dr. Osfeld and they're getting on a plant-based uh, diet and they're exercising and their blood pressure is low and they're on the aspirin and they're feeling great. You know, is there a role in repeating the CTA for that patient? I, I don't think so. Um, so I always think, will uh, will this information uh, result in a change in how I'm treating that patient? Is Are there things that are not optimized that as a result of my scan, I may optimize? And uh, so Rob, that you just mentioned, said, thank you for putting the diet on top. And he asked, like, I think, a very important question that there's some data from, from CEDARS, from the Eisner trial. He says, uh, how do we change behavior? Do you think that coronary imaging will actually change behavior in patients and a more healthy lifestyle? Yeah. Well, as, as Rob knows more than anyone, behavior is such a complex thing to change. And I, I, I'm not going to pretend like uh, imaging is going gonna, is gonna to change it, but it can be helpful. There is this concept that seeing is believing. And sometimes it's very motivating for patients to see their plaque, but also understand the, the biology behind the plaque to understand what's happening to them. So for some patients, that could be incredibly uh, informative and may result in changes and may also um, uh, result in improved adherence because a lot of patients don't want to be on stands, don't want to be in aggressive lipid lowering therapy. But once they see their plaque, the very first question that patients often have is, how can you make that plaque uh, go away? Do you have some kind of liquid draino you can pour down my coronary arteries? And, and my answer is always, no, we don't have that. But the closest thing we have is getting your LDL really low, and that can at least stop the progression of plaque. And some studies maybe cause some, some mild regression. And of course, I always emphasize doing that together, uh, not just uh, LDL lowering in isolation, but together with right lifestyle changes and a diet, uh, dietary changes, uh, um, and blood pressure control, and weight loss, and you know, uh, approaching all the other potential uh, reversible uh, factors. But I think when patients uh, do see plaque and understand that the risk factors are directly responsible for that plaque, that certainly can be motivating. Um, is that going to be the the single thing that causes everybody to change their behavior in the U.S.? No, I think I think behavior change is so complex uh, and has a whole lot more than uh, just cardiac imaging. Thank you. And I think we have the, the last question from Sami Abusaid. Uh, it's a very important question too. It says, why did the guidelines adopt a technique such as FFR that it just has one vendor and some insurances don't cover it? Do you think we'll have more vendors or more opportunities to use it? Yeah. Um, well, when a guideline committee sits together, what we review is really the, the evidence and the data. So the data has to do with the trials and at least for FFRCT, uh, numerous studies and, and trials. I think the data was actually really strong. Um, so that's really what det determines what makes it into the guideline, not whether it's one vendor or multiple vendors. Uh, and there's plenty of other examples in cardiology that a therapy was only available from one vendor. So that's not really the litmus test of whether something gets in the guideline. Having said that, uh, there are different iterations of FFRCT being developed by other companies as well. So this is something you know, we are going to see more of, and there'll be more options, both for FFRCT and for plaque analysis. Uh, uh, so we are going to see more, more vendors in this space. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful lecture. And I learned a lot. I enjoyed it a lot. And hopefully we'll see you around soon. Great. Thank you. Really, uh, really great to join all of you.